No. Hi. Um, thank you for joining our session. We're going to go over capacity planning, sizing, high availability for search, fast search in SharePoint 2013. So this is going to be a capacity planning session focused on search, not the rest of SharePoint. Um, my name is Barry Walbaum. I've been with uh, FAST uh, and Microsoft since 2005. I'm currently uh, an architect in the Search Center of Excellence, where we're working with our legacy FAST customers to help them move to SharePoint. And uh, this is the third, third SharePoint conference I've been at, um, where I presented. I did. Uh, deploying Fast Search for SharePoint in 2009, and as well as in 2011. And I'm really excited. Not super excited. Excited. I mean, I'm excited. <laughs> um, I have brought Olaf Birkeland with me. Yes, I'm Olaf Birkeland from the product group in Norway, uh, from the search group there. I've been working in Fast since uh, 98. Working primarily on scale performance issues, but doing that also typically is the guinea pig for anything with fault tolerance, reliability, that kind of problems. Okay. So um, we're going to promise we'll get you out of here before Bon Jovi gets on stage. Um, we're all pretty excited about that, too. Um, so what we're going to go over today is we're going to go over the, com uh, the components of certs in SharePoint uh, 2013. Uh, if you were at Thomas and Arena's session yesterday, they went over kind of the architecture. We're going to dive a little bit deeper in to help you understand uh, what kind of resources they're going to consume so you can build out a, uh, a nice deployment. Um, we're also going to go into capacity planning. We're going to help you plan for high availability and fault tolerance. And um, an idea I'm pretty excited about is using uh, the farm backup and restore uh, to help with uh, deployment staging as well as disaster recovery. So. Um, and here's our agenda. We're going to go into the, uh, uh, the different components of search, as well as uh, some example topologies that Olaf has been putting a lot of work into testing. Uh, we're then going to move on to understanding the fault tolerance models of the different components, as well as going into um, uh, backup and restore. And then we'll take some questions at the end. Um, we were expecting more people at the session, but there were some other really, really good sessions going on at the same time, so we have to share. Um, um, one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do, uh, there, was, uh, there was a lot of noise in uh, the blogosphere about uh, memory consumption in the beta. Um, and one of the first things I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a little bit about how you could figure out what's going on with your components. Um, I have remote desktop into a server I have in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a couple of ways you can figure out what's going on with the processes. Um, I've also tweeted this under hashtag uh, SPC172, so you can see what this is. But basically, this allows you to see the different components running under the node runner. And you can take a look and see which ones they are. Um, you can figure that out through the command line. Um, because they, all the processes have the same name. You can also use Process Explorer um, here. And as you can see, we still have an MS Search process here. Uh, the crawler lives under MS Search. So this is still the SharePoint crawler that you knew and loved in 2010, as well as the new components, which you will see running under a host controller service. So for example, this one um, is the admin component. And the big one here, um, this is the indexer. Um, the reason that the memory footprint for this one is so large is because um, it, we actually have 6 million documents indexed on this. So this isn't just an installation with nothing in it. And I'm going to show how I built out this uh, installation earlier. I actually built this from a backup that Olaf sent to me. So to go back to here. Now I am going to pass it off to Ula. Wait, do I do this one right? Sorry. <laughs> um, so you know, what's new in Search in 2013? Um, 
Well, we took a lot of different technology from both uh, Fast Search for SharePoint, SharePoint Search, and all the legacy Fast technology that we had worked on. We took Fast ESP, which was our, our big legacy platform, as well as CTS and IMS, and Mars, which was a, uh, an experimental platform that we had been working on since 2006. And um, we threw them into a blender. Um, I didn't have a blender smart art. I only had a funnel. And we basically built a single search system that's good for both building uh, websites, uh, search-based websites, as well as productivity search. So what are the changes um, that are here? They're, they're huge changes. Um, one of the big things that we worked on in this release is that we have a single search core. We have one for both on-premise, uh, Office 365, and Exchange 2013. They're all using the same search core. And you only have a single installer. With Fast Search for SharePoint, you had to install it separately to your SharePoint farm, and you had to wire the two together, and that was really problematic. So now when you install SharePoint, you get the, uh, the Fast Search engine with it. It's also multi-tenant too, so for folks who want to build out uh, an environment working with uh, multiple tenants, they'll be able to do that. Uh, Office 365 is obviously using that um, technology. And search is a really a core service in this release. It is the building block for both uh, content management, both enterprise and web content management, as well as productivity search, and um, a lot of the social features are built through uh, the search components. There's also a much more flexible deployment uh, possibilities with this release. And um, they put a huge amount of effort into improving the fault tolerance across the board, um, as well as a major overhaul of the, the UI for the users. Um, unfortunately, not as much for the admins, but the users get a really a much better search experience in this release. that already. Okay, and now I'm going to pass the floor back over to Olaf. Yeah, so we've given you a new search architecture and a lot of new search components. So those are just wanted to give you a quick overview on what they look like in a running system and how we can scale each of them. So with the new release, one of the driving factors is that we need to adapt to a lot of various uh, workloads for the system. And we introduced the ability to scale independently on three different aspects, one being the item count, the number of items you have in a certain deployment, document feed rates in terms of documents per second, and the query rate you put into this. And this can actually then be done uh, fully independently by varying your topology. So we can adapt a number of workloads, like the SharePoint on-prem uh, workload is in fact, not the most stressful for this uh, new architecture. We have, for instance, SharePoint websites, which is uh, going far beyond what's regularly seen in, in on-premise SharePoint in terms of queries per second, but then working on a much smaller product catalog, like all these uh, Contosa demos that's been shown during the week. We have uh, Exchange, which also uses the very same index engine but then with a workload much more targeted on very high item count, large email repositories, and very high number of new emails coming in for each user every day. But the query rate there is not really that high. And in our most demanding scenario is probably the Office 365, where we put a lot of tenants together in one farm to get a very good hardware utilization. But in fact, you could do whatever you need to scale your, that's not me, <laughs> to scale uh, to your need. If you have something that deviates from sort of the standard topologies we're setting up and, and recommending here, we're also gonna try to show you now a bit how you actually can do that scaling yourself. We're gonna talk mostly about why you would scale and go to the actual mechanics of doing it in PowerShell and so on. There's a session tomorrow uh, on the, doing the actual deployment stuff in PowerShell. So we highly recommend that. We'll sh give you the timing at the end of this session. For those of you that were on the architecture session yesterday, you've seen this. If you missed that session, uh, I can probably give you the 20 second recap, which essentially is these green boxes are the various search components 
plus then the web front end over here. And these are the units of scale. The, and on the left side here, you have the components responsible for putting content into the index. On the right side, you have the ones that are driving the query load. While on the bottom, you have analytics processing and admin that is working with all of them. So to show you how this is in a running system, I set up a demo topology, which is now hosting a single search component on six different VMs. So you see I have six VMs here in different remote desktop windows, hosting the admin component, call component, content processing, analytics index, and query processing respectively. In addition, then we have SQL and web front end, which then we need to complete the full user experience when you want to run something on this. So for each of these, I have a performance monitor running, and it will show then the CPU load in red, network load in green, and a disk load in blue for each of them as you start applying load to the system. So the thing that I guess all of us uh, associates most with search is queries. So let's start with uh, doing a query load. So then to actually get a decent query load onto the system, I'm bringing up uh, Visual Studio and use a standard load tester, web load test, setting up with five users uh, as a start, increasing every 15 seconds with five more users. This is just to give us a quite rapid ramp so that the demo will go quick. So you can just kick off that load. And you will see activity primarily on the bottom three components down here. So this is the web front end where the request is coming in from uh, Visual Studio, which get carried across to the query processing component, which again sends requests over to the indexer. You see all of these have a quite high CPU load. And we're now starting out with five users, so we're going to ramp it up. So you're going to see the CPU load go up over time. You also see some network load for all these three, but not really that much. So the perhaps uh, biggest spike here is sort of an indexer. You see it has more like a constant burn on disk. So that's this disk active time which essentially means that a disk is doing something. It doesn't necessarily mean that the disk is saturated. But you apparently see that indexer is quite heavy on disk, and that is something that will probably be a returning theme throughout this presentation. Is that spam or dev? This doesn't really matter. You can do both, but we'll get back a bit to the actual IOPS requirements for that. So if you look, but we take the questions at the end, so if it's not sort of ultra important to get it right now, We'll uh, try to collect them all at the end. So you see the load is now getting close to 30. And we are more or less saturating out on the uh, CPU in, on both index query processing and web front end. So if we want to dive into what actually goes in the individual one, we can start with a query processing component. And as we've seen, and quite obviously, the queries per second is really a driving factor for the CPU burn you have in that component. The other part is the item count, which also drives CPU load. Part of that is because the query component is getting more results back, it's getting more refiners, there's really more data to, to process. Second part is also as you scale out with more items, you have more index partitions, and then the query component has the responsibility of merging those together, and thus gets somewhat some more CPU load when you have a very high farm or high item count in the farm. Also shown some network dependency here, both for queries per second and for item counts, which you didn't see that much on the setup I had just had because that had only a single index partition. But again, as soon as you start to scale out, the query component needs to reach out to all of them. So for example, a fairly large scale out with 20 index partitions, 20 queries per second, we see a roughly 100 megabit going out of the query component, out of the indexers in terms of uh, the queries, and about the 200 megabit coming back. If you remember from the architecture session yesterday, a big part of that query in an on-prem scenario is actually the security ACLs. So this example is taken from an on-prem installation. 
and also the guideline up here is really reflecting what happens on an on-prem. SharePoint websites, where you don't have all these security echoes, you can easily get 10 times more queries per second uh, for each CPU core. And again, this is per CPU core, which really is hinting to that later on we'll start talking about scaling by giving a component more CPU and more resources to get more throughput. So the other component we saw with a lot of load was the index component. Again, queries per second and item count is driving CPU load on that one. We have also the same network aspect as from the query component because these are really the network communication between the two of them. But then we also have the disk load. Again, item count and queries per second is what drives uh, the disk load you're getting. The index component is also uh, more responsive and can give higher throughput if you're not filling it to the full capacity. So each index component can hold up to 10 million items as a supported limit. But for instance, if you put it less, like this installation I just showed here, it had about 1 million items. So the single indexer there was able to, to provide about 5 QPS for each core. It had four cores, so it could do like 20 QPS in total. And like you saw, these web front end and the query component and index servers all more or less getting equal amount of CPU load in this scenario. And, and this is only for productivity search, right? Yeah, this is still only productivity search. So again, uh, if you look at websites, the query is much simpler, which also reflects to much less disk lookups. You have a smaller catalog, and you get a higher QPS from that. Right, because you're not doing the security lookups for the, uh, the website search, right? Yeah, so your query goes from like 500 terms down to three or something like that. Wow, okay. In terms of disk capacity, with this release, we are recommending 500 gigabytes for each 10 million items uh, in an index component. And this is uh, slightly less than half what we had with the fast search offering in 2010. Compared to the SharePoint server, it's about on par with the same uh, disk footprint, if you calculate also the SQL footprint that the uh, search server solution had. But now we're using everything on, on the disk that could be either local disk or SAN. Uh, and in fact, deciding what you do there is more depending on the IOPS that you need to drive to have a good performance. So the crawl load, which is then putting new content into the system, is not really driving IOPS that high. It's 10 to 60 IOPS a bit depending on uh, your crawl rates. It's more the query load that can drive a high IOPS. And if you're looking at, the f at full capacity, 10 million items, and you have uh, a steady system without any ongoing calls, we're seeing in a product productivity search scenario about three reads for each query. That read load is also uh, achieved by doing a lot of caching. So in fact, when you have a have very high crawl rate, that could go up as much as 10x to about 30 disk reads for each query. So thus, it's very important that these reads have a fairly low latency, like try to stay below 15 millisecond uh, read latency, which is not really a that demanding requirement. But you could easily see if these become like 50 millisecond each, and you have a third of them for a query, you spend one and a half seconds just for going to disk. And uh, the user is not going to be happy with that. Yeah. Then we have a third workload going here with the index merge which is taking the different index parts and putting them together in, in larger file, which is good for performance. But this is going on in the background. So in practice, you can see all of these three load patterns at the same time. If you are a bit strained on your system in, for instance, the throughput, you will probably see latency going up for the random reads. If you look at the IOPS recommendations we're gonna put out on TechNet, uh, put on the bottom here what we had for a fault search for 2010. Yeah. <laughs> so what you see here is that we had this huge number of IOPS on a very large number of small files. Uh, what's dramatically changed here is that the block sizes have gone a bit up, but the number of IOPS have gone dramatically down. So this is much more friendly to like SAN environments, and even virtualization, uh, you really can't drive a couple of thousand IOPS through a VM. And also the, the throughput requirements 
have uh, gone down a little bit. So, so question for you. Uh, if I'm, you know, a productive, if I'm building a productivity search environment and I'm not able to give the system quite this much uh, I.O. bandwidth, what's going to be the behavior? What am I going to see? So the worst case scenario would be like nighttime, your master merge kicks in, uh, you're doing a lot of heavy crawling at the same time, and you have some night shift user trying to do a query. The query response time will go up, so you're not looking at like second, uh, sub-second response times, but you get in like two, three uh, query latency. So as long as, as, long as the, system, you know, the, the people know that when this is going on, there may be some query spikes and possibly some query timeouts, they could even run with uh, a lower uh, I.O. bandwidth than this. Yeah, and it's also dependent on organization. If you have something that works across multiple time zones, then obviously the night is never a good time for anyone. Right. So, but if you're a local setup, then you're much freer to use uh, the night time for doing like the merges and so on. Excellent. So this is typically playing well out with uh, five drives or so on a, on a RAID 5 or RAID 10 setup. So it's uh, more nimble than we had in 2010, and hopefully good enough for you. We are still working on this. We have achieved a lot of these reductions by introducing two new features. Uh, one of them is the in-memory in, in indexing that was shown in the architecture session yesterday. So all sort of the uh, constant churn of generating new indices is happening in memory, and you only uh, dump content to index in blobs every now and then. And the second part that we introduced a uh, meta file system, it's called a mini file system internally. I don't think that is going to be like documented, but uh, at least we're using uh, uh, meta files to capture a lot of logically smaller files in one larger file. So if you look at a 2010 installation, you could easily see some millions of files for an index component, which is now down to uh, some hundred files in 2013. And Barry going to show some backup restore practices and really having a few your number of larger files is dramatically improving that scenario. Yeah, I mean, we're not, we don't have any tools right now to really take a look within the index to try to figure out what's in there because you're, you're, the data index and the data fixml directories are gone. So there's, there's less visibility in there, but it's taking up a lot less disk space and there are a lot less files in there. So this is going to run really well, uh, especially along your, your SAN environments getting the, uh, the, the small I.O. numbers down and move it to a much smaller number of larger I.O.s is just much more compatible with a cloud or a, um, a network storage environment. So we move on to the next workload. As soon as the slide will render. I have it on my screen, but not on the... How did that happen? Oh, I, have, I have three different versions there now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try that instead. Nope. Click again. So the preview has stopped. I just have to break and re-share out, see what happens. Shift F5. There we go. There we go. So we're going to do the same thing with the crawl path. So to get some crawl going, I'm resuming all the crawls which was paused in the system as we looked at it last time. And we'll start seeing that there is a little bit of activity on admin and on SQL. We're just finding out what the state of the crawl is and finding out what content sources that are active and should be crawled. In this case, it's actually kicking off a crawl of the local SharePoint farm, so it's crawling itself and we're using the web front end as a crawl target. So you see as the crawler starts picking up a little bit here, it's actually hitting the web front end of the same farm to get the content. And the data is coming from the SQL server. So as the crawler gets really going, you'll see that SQL is doing a lot of network I.O., providing data to the web front end, which is then providing that data over again to the crawl component. Uh, you see there are some intermittent spikes here on the crawl component on the disk load. We'll discuss that a bit later on because it's perhaps a bit surprising that crawler is using this, but it is. So as the crawler has actually retrieved all the uh, content, or at least some content, that's passed further on to the content processing component, and we start seeing CPU load picking up on that one, as well as network load. So this network load is the incoming data from the crawler, and as well 
uh, content that's been processed and then sent over to the indexer. So you see an inbound network load here on the indexer, but much lower. And you also have a CPU burn on the indexer, which is uh, perhaps a bit lower than you should expect. So crawling is really not that intensive on the indexer. And you don't really see any disk activity here right now. You will see intermittently that it pops up, and that is when the in-memory indexing is actually flushing data out to the disk drive. So I guess we have seen enough here. If you then look at the crawl component, driving factors there, not surprisingly, the documents per second and to a lesser extent, the item count, because it's a bit more job managing multiple content sources and huge content sources and so forth. Same really goes for the net network load, but then in addition, we had this disk load going on on the crawler, and what's happening there is that the crawler is responsible for pulling down all the documents it finds and putting it on local share. The reason for that is the crawler is the one that has the passwords and the credentials to actually go out to all the content sites, uh, and this content is then put on a local share on the crawler itself for later pickup by the content processing component, which is the next one in the chain. So, uh, same here story here, really. It's the documents per second that uh, is uh, driving this one. And this is primarily a CPU load thing. And it can sort of, you can just push more and more to this component, and it will uh, process almost uh, to get to a peak on 100% CPU if you like. So that's really up to how hard you would like to crawl. As an estimate in a productivity search scenario, we're seeing roughly five to 10 documents per second for each CPU core you give to the content processing. But again, the document is everything from a tiny list item to a huge PDF. So uh, your mileage is obviously gonna vary, but this is typically what you see on our internal deployments uh, for uh, Office and uh, also in the entire Microsoft organization and all the SharePoint sites we have there. The next workload is the analytics processing. This normally then runs uh, at night. So to be actually, to be able to show you what's going in here, I'm gonna go in on the admin node and then through PowerShell trigger uh, analytics run so that we actually will have the activity on the system. So I trigger that. And then I just need to go back and show you all the components here. And immediately see the analytics component have started processing burning CPU and disk. This is a MapReduce engine that uses the disk to store intermediate results that is picked up by, by later stages. And as the analytics uh, gets a bit further, it has actually updates to the index, and you will see much the same as you saw with the crawl load. Some CPU load on the indexer, not too much yet, but we will get some more load here eventually as the analytics is done with some content, and some intermittent disk load when the index is flushing new content out to the disk. So quick recap of analytics perhaps look a bit bad on this picture, but it's just showing the impact of uh, the item count is really the main dri driving factor for how much resources analytics will need. So if you have a very large farm, with a very high number of items, you need to scale out analytics to be able to get through your entire corpus in a reasonable time. And uh, the topologies we'll show later on is typically scaled to be able to do that during four to six, eight hours so you can do it off peak hours at night. And, and just, just to let folks know, if you run a lot more analytics components, there's more network load as well, right? Yes, so this is MapReduce in its pure uh, incarnation. So as soon as you start spreading out, there's also a lot of uh, workload that is shift going between these. So that's why I put this sort of a huge network dependency. And that only happens as soon as you really scale the analytics out to run on multiple nodes. Right. So good practice there is really to not have analytics provisioned on a high number of nodes and using a small fraction on each of them, but rather concentrate it into a fewer set of, of uh, machines, virtual machines or physical machines, and give them uh, more resources and run it on like even one or two VMs uh, for the entire setup. So 
So the component that's sort of been lurking in the corner we've not really looked much at is the search admin. That is really an admin. It doesn't really do much. It needs to be there to take care of all the others. And all the times you're going to really need to care about this one is if you go to very large topologies, like 100 million items and larger than that. So other than that, your main issue is really that you need a place to host it. And you typically also would like to host a redundant uh, admin so that you can uh, have your uh, primary admin fail without the service going down. Yeah, this is finally fault tolerant. Um, you don't have to do crazy stuff in order to uh, make the admin recover in the case of failure. It just happens. <laughs> we know you've been struggling with that one, so. <laughs> so some key takeaways from the looking at the components individually. It's important that you try to split your bulk processing, that is the crawl, the analytics, the content processing, away from the query traffic, which is then indexing and query processing. The index query process and the query processing is uh, very latency dependent, and having some heavy CPU load on the same VM is uh, not necessarily good. We have also done some uh, tweaks to the bulk processing, so we'll show that later on, that actually allows you to run everything within one VM if you would like to have a dense setup. All these components allows for two modes of scaling. We could either make more resources to each component, like scaling a VM from uh, two cores to four cores to eight cores, 12, whatever, and you will get uh, a linear increase in performance by doing that. The other alternative is just multiplying out by having multiple components running on individual servers. So both of these are just the standard scale up, scale out, and we support both of them. And also, be, take care in uh, the shared resources here, where, especially when you're on virtualized scenarios. You are sharing, for instance, network out of the same physical machine when you have two VMs there. So putting two VMs that both have a very high network dependency together on the same box, it, it's not necessarily a good thing, especially if one of them is like the query component. But then again, you can work around that by giving each a virtual switch and have a dedicated physical adapter for each of them so that you don't really mix that workload. So there's a lot of uh, virtualization recommendations that's going to come out on TechNet. Where we're going to show all the experience we had during the release cycle. And in fact, the majority of the testing in, in this release has been on virtual machines. So we really have a very good story and a good traction on how to do that uh, in a good way. So dynamic memory is bad? Dynamic memory is bad because you don't know what you're getting. If you want a consistent performance, you want a consistent response from your system, and you don't know whether you have two gigs or 16 gigs of memory available, it's very hard to predict what it will perform. Yeah, we saw a lot of problems with that in the past. Uh, the components think they have a lot more memory, but the memory is actually on disk, and uh, therefore the performance is really bad. So dynamic memory is bad. It's, it's bad for things that actually use its memory. It's good for things that is only used for a, a, a five minutes a day. This right. is used all the time. So it's not necessarily any memory that you can spare by using dynamic memory. We'll get back to that. Yeah, we, ha we have some slides up coming up on that. So put together this uh, brief overview of the components. So uh, for admin, don't really have to give it that much consideration as I said. For the crawler, it's mainly taking care of that you have sufficient network load and that you are isolating away the disk load from the crawler from especially the indexer. In terms of content processing and analytics, they are both quite heavy on CPU, but those processes are by default scheduled with the below normal priority. So if you actually run those together with an indexer or together with a crawler, they will yield CPU resources as soon as one of the others need that. So that's how we are able actually to run all of these components together in one VM, and these heavy bulk components will actually step back and yield resources as soon as you need that CPU for some other workload. Like I said, analytics on a high scale load in terms of many analytics components is gonna drive the network load. And then we have index, which is the most heavyweight component of them all. 
So this is typically where you will start your scaling, finding out your index topology and really using that as the cornerstone of your deployment and then put up the rest that support your overall scenario. For most on-prem scenarios in SharePoint, you will not really need to look hard on the query processing component. It's not really going to be a demanding, uh, demanding component to, to host. If you are more on uh, SharePoint websites, uh, you should give this a bit more uh, thought. So getting to then actual topologies for how we can lay these components out. So for anything up to 10 million items, you don't need more than one of each of the search components. You of course need to scale out your other SharePoint applications and your web front end, but we will not cover that in this session, and it's, like I said, done independently of how you would like to search the search part of your farm. So for anything up to 10 million items, we recommend setting aside eight CPU cores, 24 gigabytes of RAM, 800 gigabytes of disk for the combined workload of all of these. And I keep repeating myself, but index on a separate disk is a very good practice. It actually saves you a bit of cost because you can run less performant disk as soon as you just isolate the load away instead of trying to put everything together and beef that up to be super, super performant. Are these um, physical CPU cores or are they uh, like hyper-threaded CPU cores? These are uh, sort of the resource allocation is based on physical cores. We do, of course, support running hyper-threaded and I actually would recommend doing that. But don't uh, sort of, or look to what Intel says about uh, hyper-threading. You get like 30, 40% more performance. You're not getting twice the performance even though you see twice the amount of logical cores. So don't expect that the eight core machine hyper-threaded to 16 is performing more than like 11, 12 cores. So use that sort of as your resource uh, capability of the machine you're running at. But it, could you take it afterwards? For 10 million can host all, all components in a single box. And it can even be part of a box. So if this is Windows Server 212, and you're running on a physical server, of course putting eight CPU cores and uh, 24 gigs of memory is no problem at all within one box. If you want to virtualize, it's really the same in history because you can create a single VM of that size with 2012. Same also goes for a physical server on 2008 R2, because that, of course, eight cores, 24 gigs of memory is uh, not any problem for that operating system. Although if you want to virtualize on Windows Server 2002, there's a Hyper-V limit that prevents making VMs bigger than four cores. So thus, we need to actually split the workload into two VMs due to that uh, Hyper-V limitation. So the split is done by using four CPU cores. Sorry. Using four CPU cores, eight gigabytes of RAM, 300 gigabytes of disk for the bulk processing part. So you see here I've taken the principle of splitting bulk processing on this side and the query processing on this other VM. So we're trying to get some separation between them even though they're on the same physical. So the total footprint here is really exactly the same as we had when everything was running in one VM. We just split that resource footprint in two. So on the query processing side, we have 16 gigabytes of RAM, 500 gigabytes of disk, and most of that is actually going to be consumed by the index component over here. So then we want to make this fault tolerant. Uh, before I do that, I just want to change the coloring here to let you be able to see the different search components, especially as you start building something larger. It's becoming probably hard to read the text in the back if it's not already impossible. So to make this full tolerant, we have this original setup with one host with two VMs, and we'll use this 2008 deployment uh, model in the presentation now, but of course in a 2.12 we don't need two VMs and so forth, but that will be reflected in the TechNet uh, documentation. But for the presentation now, we keep the 2008, since that's probably where most of you will be starting from. 
So to get it redundant, we need a second host holding the very same search components. So you have two sort of perfect copies of the system. You also need to have a SQL, of course, to be fault tolerant. And Barry will, uh, from later slides, go into a bit more detail on uh, what the requirement that has on SQL setup. So this setup is the smallest you can do on v VMs that will be fully uh, fault tolerant. And for instance, today being Patch Tuesday, you could take down a half of this, patch it, bring it back up again, then patch the other half, and you don't have any service outages. So we have SQL there. Barry's gonna do a bit on the fault tolerance part, but sort of the resource uh, demands we have on there is really three databases that has the highest demand. Uh, the crawl database, you probably remember from uh, 2010, it's much the same, although which are re very reduced IOPS requirement. And the scaling here in 2013 is really the databases are per the number of items, and we don't really care how they are distributed among uh, your content sources, start addresses, and the crawl components. It's really a pool of crawl DBs that are used by all of them. So simply look at the number of items you have, and then you decide on the number of DBs you do by having a scaling of one DB per 20 million items. If you underscale and you exceed the capacity, you can just add a DB later on and rebalance the whole stuff. For the linked DB, we're recommending one per 60 million items. So that is not growing as quickly. And also then the SQL IOPS for that is roughly 10 IOPS for each one million items. So this is again dependent on the total volume you have for doing all the analytics stuff. Then we have the analytics reporting store where there's uh, the recommendation from the product group is not really to look at like the number of items but more look at the database size itself because this is extremely dependent on the usage load you're putting on this. What are your users doing on the site? Do they do a lot of uh, social or are they just browsing a document every now and then or it's really hard to give metrics based on the content volume. It's very much more dependent on what your customer are doing. Or not the customer, perhaps the user is the right term. And of course you have the search DB, uh, search admin DB, which is uh, one DB. You don't need to do any scaling with that. And it's also very lightweight. So put up some examples here from a 10 million and 100 million item farm. And you see that the sizes uh, are growing, of course, with more items, more or less linearly. Uh, the log space here, although, is a bit higher uh, than you would expect if you just look at the scale difference. But that is due to the 100 million uh, system has been running longer, so the logs has not been truncated yet. So if you were to trunk the log space, you will get uh, that cut down dramatically. So then we had a small topology, and everything up to 10 million can fit in that one. And as an example, now we're gonna show how we're thinking when building this up to a 40 million farm instead, the medium topology as we use in the tech documentation. So the main difference here is that the index, number of index items is going up from 10 million to 40 million. With given 10 million per index partition, it's obviously also an increase from one to four index partitions. You also have a, need to have a second crawl DB and more analytics resources to handle this higher item count. In this scenario, we have envisioned that the actual number of queries per second is not changing, but if it do, we could of course then scale for that as well. We are anticipating a higher uh, document per second rate because more content typically means more changes and we also need the first initial full crawl to be able to complete in like within a week. So what does this mean in practice? If you start out with a small topology, one host with everything, now we're gonna host four times more content. And we are able to do that by adding two more hosts with two VMs each. Again, assuming this 2008 uh, VM uh, scaling model. But of course, if this were pure physicals, you could just ignore the VMs I'm putting up here. 
So first thing we'd like to do is to move the index and the query processing component onto one of these new hosts. This is in order to further separate the bulk processing away from the query processing. So you get even better isolation than you had in the first case where it was running in fact in the same host which will have some cross effects between those two VMs. Then we needed also more index partitions. So add three more to get to the full index capacity. I promised analytics a bit more resources. So I have this vacant VM over here. So we're gonna, just gonna move analytics there. And since this has less competition and it's running as a below priority process, it will actually be able to do quite a bit more. Same applies for the counter processing component. But we're adding one and still keeping one on the call component because this is uh, able to utilize all the whatever leftover CPU and it's typically quite much that is leftover from the crawl component. So what you'll see in this topology, if you're doing a heavy crawl, these two VMs will be more or less saturated on uh, CPU and you actually want that because you wanted them to process as fast as possible. We then want to make this fault tolerant and the pattern is essentially exactly the same as for the small topology. You do a replica of all the components. The only slight deviation here is that I moved the query processing component to another index partition. The reason for that is to distribute the overhead of hosting that query processing component across a separate index partition so that the different index partitions, again, get quite equal in terms of the performance. So there you have the medium search topology. And like I said, this is more the functional part of it, how you actually use PowerShell to do this configuration. And you can even do that scale out from a small to a medium on a live system. It's gonna be in that deployment session tomorrow. A second crawl DB, not the second crawler. So what you see in this topology is that the crawler has still lots of resources to crawl faster. Uh, if you get any saturation at all, it's typically on the network. And you can beef that up by perhaps running 10 gigs on the crawlers or running two uh, one gigs, or you don't necessarily have to beef it up by having more crawlers or more CPU resources for the crawler. So the, the, the crawler is one of the big components that can saturate the gigabit length? Yeah. Okay. Again, given that your content source is able to keep up, like we saw in the crawl example, you saw a lot of load on the web front end. And in that form, we did have a dedicated crawl target. So if you really want to crawl extremely fast, you also need to have one or more crawl targets that can take that load, and also so that your web front end is not saturated from your regular user traffic. This is within one data center, yes. So I'll, I'll get into the disaster recovery stuff a little bit later. So some uh, general guidance to sum up the topologies. Uh, having consistent performance across uh, all these machines you're putting in place is very important. For Hyper-V, we're gonna produce a number of recommendations, like I said, based on the resources we have. But the main takeaway is really don't use Hyper-V as a way to cheat and oversubscribe your resources. We do need the resources we ask you for, and uh, user Hyper-V to sort of try to trick us is not gonna help you. And uh, third thing here is antivirus. I guess, Barry, you can tell all the horror stories of uh, customers having real-time scanning on the index files, and uh, like uh, the antivirus program needing half a minute to look at the file before it gives it up to the indexer. Yeah, this support's gonna ask you if you're having performance problems, uh, is antivirus turned on? and on the, uh, the index directory. Um, as well as if you have a, a SAN, do not run the local defrag on the server. Let the SAN take care of that for you. So we're putting up now 10, 40, and 100 million topologies on TechNet. This is, link is going live hopefully next week. Uh, we will keep extending this with more topologies as we get the, the test backing to, to put it out. Uh, but what we're putting out now has been very thoroughly tested and we will uh, just adding scenarios and also feedback on if you see scenarios that we should really uh, add to that, that's more than welcome. So I'll hand it over to Barry to go a bit on to the next stages. Well, just something I found on the general SharePoint guidance, which I think is a clue written by someone even wiser than me. Don't try to be cheap on hardware. It's gonna 
costs you more than it costs you to debug the system. Yeah, the hardware is cheaper than the people to debug it, yep. generally. OK, so to move on, um, we're, we're pretty good on time. We're, you're not going to miss Bon Jovi. So uh, to, next step is we're going to start talking about the, uh, the fault tolerance model in here. Um, and you know, fault tolerance is basically the whole concept that your system will continue functioning even in the case that you have a component failure. And um, you have the opportunity to you know, keep the system running at full performance or degraded performance in the case of failure. And we'll go over that. So for search, you know, the different types of high availability is you can have uh, the content side, you know, the crawling side. And that's going to require that you have the full redundancy of the content feeding chain. Uh, in this case, uh, the admin, the crawler, the content processing component, and the index. Uh, for query side high availability, you're going to need a full redundancy of all the query components. Um, so the difference here is you're going to need um, redundancy of the query processing component, the index, uh, the web front end, as well as admin. And this is really critical for internet websites. And um, you, know, you get, really have to make sure that you know, queries aren't going down. So for disaster recovery, uh, there's been a huge improvement in this in the, uh, for a release. Um, you have kind of the choice of different types of uh, DR. Um, in the past, if you wanted hot, you would basically have to do um, two completely separate deployments in different locations, uh, crawling the data independently, and hoping that things kept in uh, uh, sync. And that was difficult with configuration changes. And it was very expensive operationally. Um, now what we're going to allow you to do is take a full backup of your primary system. And I'm going to go into what kind of uh, service changes you expect while that's going on. And then ship it to the DR environment and do the restore. So for a hot environment, you would just have the restored environment continue the crawl from where it left off. So you're not doing everything completely independently. For warm, uh, I expect that you're going to do a backup of your primary environment, ship it to someplace else, deploy it, have it running, but not necessarily continue the crawl. And that is really what I'm expecting. Most of the DR, uh, that's probably going to be the best practice right there. And for cold is you'll still do the backup, ship it to someplace else, but not actually deploy it. And for the cold, you won't necessarily have, the, uh, the li uh, have to pay licensing for the, the DR environment, because it won't be running if the primary is up. So backup and restore is now a best practice. I'm going to focus primarily on the farm backup and restore. There are other backup and restore methodologies that Knut and Darren are going to get into tomorrow. Um, and you know, it is important to understand that if you want a highly available environment, it is going to add cost to your deployment. And um, you need to make sure that you scale for it. So a little bit about the content processing fault tolerance in this release. Um, uh, each of the crawler is going to send the content that it crawls to a content processing component. It will tend to pick the same content processing component here. So in the case that content processing component goes down, the crawler will have to reestablish the connection with another content processing component that's still up. So it will have to resubmit the documents that it has not received the callbacks for. Within the content processing component, there is a load balancer that will uh, tend to randomly create a crawler flow with any of the existing crawling content processing components that are up. Now, the crawler flow is where the document processing is going on, where we're extracting the text, uh, where we have the eye filters running, and the new parsers in this release. And from there, they'll pass it on to a content router. And the content router is responsible for uh, pushing the new content to uh, the indexer. So to talk a little bit about index fault tolerance, and um, this is vastly improved over in 2010. So um, here, the, 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 once the content processing component has processed the content, the content router within there will pass it off to the primary replica. Okay? And the primary replica and the backup replicas for a partition 
will remain completely in sync on disk. So in the case that there's a failure in one of them, it, the, you can recover much faster than you could in the past. So in the case the backup replica goes down patch Tuesday, you wanted to uh, update the system, the primary replica will continue to index the content. When the backup replica comes back up, uh, it will first do a sync of the journal. The journal is very similar to what you have within a database. And once it's synchronized, um, it will then start serving queries again. And I mean, one of the, the best practices here is if you are going to start patching your systems, it's probably a good idea to pause the crawl. It is not a requirement to do that, but it just means that that backup environment can uh, serve queries quicker because it doesn't have to synchronize with the primary environment. So the other scenario that I want to talk about is what happens if you're patching the primary replica? Because you don't have control over which one is which in this release. So the backup will become the, the primary, and that's what, five seconds it takes about? Something like that. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's much, much quicker in the past. And we'll continue indexing content here. And then when the, the previous primary comes back up, it will come back up as a, a backup replica, and it will do a journal sync. So this is the state the system is left in. So to go into the query processing component, um, the user types in a query on the web front end. And on each of the web front end nodes, there is a SSA proxy, a search service application proxy. And that will pass on the query to um, the query and site setting service running on the query processing node. You don't configure this separately. This is part of the configuration for the query processing component. Um, this runs within IIS, and it will use a round robin load balancing uh, there. Then the Query and site setting service will pass off the query to the uh, query processing component, and we'll use a lowest load load balancing, um, and that will update fairly frequently. So you're going to get a fairly even load across the, the query processing components. And then from there, it's going to tend to um, it's going to make the query to the um, to a full replica with all the index partitions. And it's going to do something really cool in this release, where it's going to do a sticky load load balancing. So if someone types in the same query for the second time, it will tend to use the same uh, index replicas to send the query, because that will have uh, things fresh in cache. There was a question about that yesterday um, in uh, Thomas and Runa's session, and, and that's how that is going to work. So admin fault tolerance. I was really excited in this release. And when, uh, you know, over a year ago, when I, when I started engaging with the product group on uh, what this release is going to be like, I was like, you have to fix admin fault tolerance. It was, it was, it was a very difficult thing for both sizing and operations, especially with fast search for SharePoint. So in this release, um, they have a, uh, all the state is within the database. So you're, you're seeing something. Um, a, a pattern here that we're keeping state within the database. So the primary admin will have a lease on this database. And if for some reason that goes down, um, after a short period of time, when the lease expires, the backup will take over. So this is not load balance. This, this is just a primary failover. The load on this is fairly low, so that shouldn't be a problem. Okay. So database fault tolerance. Um, the database and the index must be kept in sync. So we're providing the backup and restore, which I'm going to show you guys in a little bit and how that works. Um, we're definitely supporting SQL 2008 R2 and SQL uh, 2012. And for the search indices at the moment, we only support synchronous mirroring. Okay, so we're not supporting the asynchronous modes or any of the, uh, the log shipping modes. I'm, I'm, I'm engaged with the product group to try to figure out what the long-term supportability of this is. But this is where they've done the primary test right now. OK, so now I'm going to talk about the, uh, the last major topic, which is backup and restore. And things look like you have to go back and 
Can I miss it? Are we sure it's out? It's oh. choking again. Yeah. Escape, shift, five, five. Nice, fine. So last section will be back up and restore. Um, and um, as, as Ulof was saying earlier, we have designed the index better to use more, uh, less larger files and that you know, many less larger files because with you know, some of the previous releases with Fast Search for SharePoint specifically, you could conceivably have millions of files within the index and backing those up on a Windows system. Um, for, for the keynote for the SharePoint conference last year, uh, the 108 million document index that I built took 27 hours to back up. 25 of that was just backing up the FixML files. So I was very happy when we got rid of FixML. It's much improved for helping out with the backup. And clearly, everything but the, back, everything but the index is in the database. So there's no stray configuration files around, which means that most of the components within here are stateless. The only one that isn't stateless is the index. So you know, resizing later on is possible. Um, you know, recovering from failure is easier because you don't have to deal with uh, backing up any uh, physical nodes. Um, it's also a point in time backup. There's going to be no query downtime during the backup, and I'm going to get into more details on how that works in a minute. And um, the backup and restore, I think, is really going to be the way to make disaster recovery a lot easier um, operationally than we've had in the past. Um, so how does the backup work? Um, well, the process happens. Um, it can get kicked off through... Um, PowerShell, so this is the farm backup, so you can use backup SP farm, or you can go through central admin, and the first thing is going to do is it's going to pause the major index cleanup jobs, which is the master merge. That's the big index cleanup job that was consuming potentially 100 megabytes per second read and write that Olaf showed earlier. And it will also pause the shadow index cleanup. So the index will, will keep growing while the backup is going on. So the first phase is that we're going to copy the master index, and that should be about 90% of the total size of the index, potentially larger. And we do a full backup of the SQL databases for search. For phase two, this is where we pause crawling here. So we want to make sure that we're not making any changes, any more changes to the crawl databases. And we do an incremental backup of the SQL databases as well as copy all the shadow indices. Once that's completed, we resume everything, and everything continues. Um, so some examples we have um, for search beta, uh, it was about 80 million documents we indexed, um, and it was about two terabytes of data for the backup. It took approximately eight hours to do the backup, and um, about six hours to do the restore, just to give you some of sizing, but we were only pausing, crawling for 45 minutes of this. So even though it took eight hours to do this, you could really do this nightly in a production environment. Um, and when you say that you do this thing, it's really all automatic, like all these phases is happening by itself. Yeah, yeah, you, there's no human inter interaction. I mean, you, you kick off the backup and you go home for the night. Um, for MSIT, they were able to back up one and a half terabytes of data in 90 minutes. Well, they have a much better hardware and network, didn't they? They have a better network and a bit uh, fatter file share to back up to. Ah, and, uh, and you know, they, they, okay, they did use physical servers, and the crawl was only paused during, for, uh, for five minutes. That oh, was pretty cool. So, you know, restoring of the search service application, um, you could restore the whole farm from the backup, or you can only restore the, uh, the search service application. Search service application is a container uh, that all the components live in, and they're managed that way, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, in the case you had a single node failure, you don't have to restore that node. You can bring up a new node, add it to the SharePoint farm, and use the topology commandlets, which Knut and Darren are going to show you a lot more about tomorrow, to add that missing component back to that node. So provided that you haven't lost uh, the only uh, copy of an index partition, um, this is going to be the way to do it. Okay. So one of the ideas that I've been thinking about here that I think is going to be really cool is that 
you use the backup and restore to help uh, jumpstart your production crawl before you potentially even have your production hardware. So um, one of the things that you can do here is you can take your production environment. So this is the, um, the small fault tolerant uh, Windows Server 2008 R2 environment that um, Olaf showed you. And you can take a backup of this. So when you do the restore, you have to restore all the components. You can't leave uh, fault tolerant components or other components around. So the smallest I can get this to is bringing this back up onto nodes. And, and for doing the restore, we don't really care about the performance of the system. We just need to restore it. And afterwards, we're going to uh, remove the additional components using the, uh, the topology commandlets. So now you have a QA environment, OK? So you built this QA environment, which is single node deployment. And you want to start crawling your production content. And you don't really care how slow it is, but you want to get a jump start on crawling, let's say, you know, 10 million documents. So you start the crawl in QA. And when you have the production hardware ready, take a backup of the QA environment, and then deploy it to production. So you know, here's a SharePoint farm. We're only deploying the components on a single VM. So you know, the first step in modifying the topology will be to add um, a copy of the index uh, and the query processing components to another one of the VMs. And um, you need to do it this way with the index. You can't just remove and add the index, otherwise you'll lose the data. So this would be step one. And then step two is we'll move the other components. So this is how you can fairly easily move back and forth between QA and production. And, and we expect this is a, a pattern that um, our customers are going to use in this release. So I, I personally tried the, uh, the backup and restore quite a lot in this release. Uh, I'm on the services side, so you know, I have to make sure. I didn't want to just tell you that this stuff worked without trying it a lot. Um, Olaf has actively been testing it. So um, I said, uh, to Olaf, can you please send me you know, a large backup? So um, I played with that for a while, and um, I've come up with some good suggestions in terms of making it easier to do a restore. Um, anything you can do to keep your primary and disaster recovery environment as similar as possible is definitely recommended. Farm layout, host names, database version, and uh, directory locations um, for where you're keeping the index. If those are sim more similar, doing the restore is a lot easier. There's a lot less you need to change there. And um, test your recovery procedures. Do not wait for a disaster to try to see if you can figure out how to do the restore. It, it does take a little while to figure out. I'm sorry? Um, they don't have to necessarily be the same host names. They can be different host names. But if they're similar, the amount of changes you're going to have to make through the, the web forms will be less. So if you just change, like, say, one character in the host names between your, your primary and your DR environment, the, the likelihood that you're going to fat finger it and have to do it again and again and again while your boss is like, we need this thing back up now. Um, I mean, it just, it's just going to be easier. So, um, I'm going to do a little demo. Um, so, you know, here's central admin. Um, I'm going to go into restore um, backup farm. And just, just to give you an idea, let me show you this. Um, uh, so this is the, um, the, the, the backup Olaf sent me, the, the 70. It, so for the un... For, for, I'm sorry, for the compressed data that he sent me, um, since he was shipping it from Europe to the United States, he compressed it first. For a 6 million document index, the whole backup was uh, 22 gigs compressed and 78 gigabytes uncompressed. So you can see it's about 3.5, 4 to 1 uh, compression ratio between these two. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to central admin and backup and restore and give it the directory that I have the backup in. And I'm going to select it and move it forward. So, um, so as you can see here, it took 
it took this backup for six million documents, uh, 33 minutes to run. And you said you did prime, most of your testing on virtual machines, right? Yeah, this is a VM. So how about with 2010? Did you do most of your testing with virtual machines or physical servers? For fast search, we never touched virtual servers. So yeah, so uh, the, here's, here's the big difference. So for fast search for SharePoint, the vast majority of development testing was on physical machines. Where SharePoint 2013 search, fast search, we're allowed to say that, is Lulav did the vast majority of the testing on virtual machines. So we're not going to run into a lot of the early VM problems that we had in the past. So let's see. So I'm going to go to next. OK. So he did a whole farm backup. Um, I'm not going to restore all of it. I'm only concerned about um, the search service application. So I'm going to select that here. And there's something important to know, that when you do a restore of a backup, you need to make sure that that search service application proxy exists. If it doesn't exist, your queries, all your queries will error out, and you will not know why. Adding that SSA proxy is a single uh, line of uh, PowerShell to do that. That happens, that can complete in five seconds, and all of a sudden the, uh, the queries uh, will work again. But so, the whole guys in the audience probably saw it at the bottom there. Yeah. Because the proxy is a separate uh, group in that. Uh, yeah, exactly. So there you go. There, so the, the proxies are restored separately. So those are actually outside of the search service application. And oops. So as you can see here, you have the option of doing a uh, new configuration or the same configuration as the backup. So if your backup environment is the same, uh, your DR environment is the same as the, um, your primary environment. You just click Same and hit Next, and your restore starts happening. Otherwise, you have the option of changing everything here. Um, I did a lot of research to try to figure out how easy this was to potentially automate. And unfortunately, Restore SP Farm um, reprompts you for a, a lot of stuff. So. Uh, most of the testing that was done, especially on the search beta dog food that we did, they actually used central admin to do the restore. So like we said with the, the machine name, so if, if you had, if you changed just, you know, current to DR, then you could bring all this stuff back up. So uh, I'm not going to fully run through the restore because it takes about 33 minutes to run, but um, this was uh, how I was able to get such a large index um, without necessarily having to crawl the data. So I was able to see a lot of the performance characteristics of the whole system. I'm sorry? I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hear you? Oh, no, you cannot. You have to restore the topology as it is. That was one of the, uh, the things I showed earlier. But you can, after you do a restore to a bigger environment, you can remove uh, the index, uh, you know, a, a fault tolerant copy of the index. To, you can restore to a DR environment smaller than the primary, but it has to start a little bit larger. Okay, so to move on with the recap, I apologize, we're running just a little bit late. Um, you know, we, we hope that, you know, we've given you a really good idea of the performance characteristics of the components in search in uh, 2013, and that you know that you guys have a fairly good idea to do the capacity planning. The closer you deploy to the the, the tested 10, 40, 100 million document topologies, um, I think the I think that's probably a good way to start right now is to look at those and see how those meet your requirements. Um, and we hope that you have a uh, better understanding of the high availability and that you uh, see that, you know, the, the system can handle fault much better than we've had in the past. And uh, I hope uh, the DR stuff was interesting for you. So a couple more things. Um, I believe the hands-on labs are up now. Um, and, you know, check out the hands-on labs. Um, definitely come to the Ask the Expert session. Um, um, Olaf and I will be there. If you guys have any, you know, deep technical questions, feel free to come by. Uh, we'll find a whiteboard. We'll we'll hang out for a while, have a beer, um, and um, you know, some of the other sessions that I would definitely recommend. 
there's a troubleshooting session uh, with Darren, Ed, and Agnes tomorrow, um, as well as the deployment tomorrow afternoon at 1.45 with Darren and Knut. I highly recommend that because there have been some changes made in this release. You can't do a lot of the topology changes through central admin, and we're going to go over how the commandlets work. Um, they're a lot easier than in 2010 trying to deploy uh, an SSA through uh, PowerShell commandlets. In 2010 was difficult. It's much easier now. And they're going to go over that as well as we're going to publish some example um, examples on how to do this for the, uh, the 10, 40, and 100 million document topology on TechNet. Um, and, you know, we've also been getting a lot of questions, you know, about um, hybrid between SharePoint Online and on-prem. And Renee is going to do a session tomorrow on how to link the two of them together to produce a search center that allows you to search both of them. So um, uh, thank, you for your, uh, thank you for coming today. Um, do you guys have any questions? If you can move to the microphone, we can, it would be nice. So you're asking if there's a document size limit in the crawler? Yes, for the crawler, it's going down for crawler size. I heard 1,000 megabytes will not be, 1,000 megabyte documents will not be crawled. Yeah, so do you know the, uh, the default on that? I know there's a registry key in that, and I believe that's still there. There's a setting, and there's a default. I don't remember the exact number, but it is a limit to, a, it will not attempt downloading that document. I think it can be overridden. We should have had uh, Vidi here now to answer that. <laughs> but uh, there is there's sort of a pr protection limit there to avoid, like if we hit a terabyte document, you should try really to download that. So. Yeah. But you can override it, given that you actually have a business case for doing that. You'll skip it. Thank you, Michael. Okay. So you're asking about the, the incremental crawl on file shares, uh, um, and that the, it still had to do a full crawl every time. Um, were you using the, I believe in SharePoint 2010 SP1, they introduced kind of this smart foldering that is supposed to help with that. Have you tried that? So you might want to check that out because I think you might find it works better even with 2010. Yes, yeah, so they're, they're, they're using that going forward too. Well, the, the, the fix ML that we had, so the question is, if you have a corrupt index partition, um, can it be rebuilt, rebuilt? How is it rebuilt? Well, in this release, we've done a couple of things. First of all, the, the primary and the replica environments, um, there's much better swapping over between the two. We don't have like that kind of index source that existed in the past. So if you realize one is corrupt, um, I believe there's going to be some manual intervention going on where you would basically delete that index, and then the, 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 the other index partition will copy things over. So it does actually happen without manual intervention. If it's detected as bad, it will just be uh, replaced by the replica that has a working copy. Did you test that? Yeah. Awesome. We had a number of cases where we actually have disk failures. So. Yeah. So in the case of disk failures, the other index, the other copy, the other replica for that index partition will overwrite the corrupt data. So it'll go through a, what's called a reseeding, which will happen when you are totally lost. Right, and there's also the backup, the backup process works a lot better in this release, so definitely recommend doing that. 
periodically as best practices as well. So the, the whole concept of rebuilding from FixML is gone, and uh, yeah, that, it, 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 it added a little bit of security, but it really um, it, it made the whole made it very difficult for us to solve a lot of these other problems. You see. The thing is that an index needs to be in sync with your databases. So if you take an index that is an, from another time than the, all the others, that won't work. So you would have to do the restore of the whole system. We're not recording this conversation. Oh. We're kind of moved. Okay. So maybe we can just okay. bring it all down. Okay. Okay. Let's stop recording so we just take it off.